Hello. Tighten your seatbelt. You may not need to move during this session. I can assure you that by the time Professor Mike Muller steps here, takes this microphone, you would not likely move. This session is carefully planned. It's supposed to be the, one of the high points of the Africa Focus. We've talked generally in the morning about shared waters and shared benefits. We want to be more specific during this session. This session on cooperation in hydro diplomacy, successful approaches to optimize transboundary water management, convened by the Africa Water Facility, an initiative of the African Minister's Council on Water, ably housed at the African Development Bank. I will not do the job of the moderator by giving you a rundown of the panelists that we have for this session. But all I can say is that the panel is loaded. And I'd advise you to, again, find some form of sit belt, get ready, as I introduce Professor Mike Muller, a commissioner in South Africa's first national planning mission, a visiting adjunct professor at the Wicks University Graduate School, chair of the World Economic Forum Agenda Council on Water Security. As a director general, then in the Department of Water Affairs, South Africa, from 1997 to 2005, Mike led the development and implementation of new policies, legislation, and programs in water resources and services, as well as the country's participation in the ongoing Lesotho Highlands Water Project and other high-profile negotiations. It is with this very rich experience and background that Mike Pence the role he will be playing today to moderate the session on cooperation and transboundary diplomacy, successful approaches to optimize transboundary water management. Let's, let's put our hands together for Professor Mike Muller. Thanks very much for that and good afternoon. Um, we know that the lunch uh, is getting crowded, so I'm sure we're going to see people coming in as we go. Um, as, as the uh, chair of the session said, uh, I'm here not as a panelist. I've had that privilege taken away from me. I'm, I've been asked to, uh, to moderate this session. Um, the session is one of the African Water Facility, correctly stated as an AMCAO institution that is hosted at the African Development Bank. It's one of our proud uh, creations of uh, 2002, the World Summit for Sustainable Development. Uh, one of the outcomes was the formation of the facility, as, a, uh, as will, will be explained to you. Because it is an AWF event, I'd like to ask Kisabati, one of our uh, panelists, but also the coordinator and leader of the African Water Facility, to just start us off by explaining um, what it is that uh, the AWF is hoping to get uh, from today's session. And once she's done that, we'll sit the, uh, the, the panel down. So I guess if I can hand over to you to start with, if you are ready to go. Thank you, Mike. And first of all, uh, first of all uh, allow me to welcome you today. As Mike said, this uh, session is organized by uh, the African Water Facility and is part of the uh, Africa Focus Day. I would like to start by saying that sustainable development and utilization of the shared water resources present an opportunity for regional integration. 
Sustainable socioeconomic development, poverty alleviation, and protection of the vital ecosystems. And it's a great vehicle for achieving the MDGs and the Africa Water Vision. The outstanding challenge, however, in developing these water resources in Africa lies in establishing the appropriate infrastructure, water facilities, institutional platforms and frameworks for greater cooperation and sustainable basin utilization among the dependent countries. The African Water Facility is a key regional instrument for fostering transboundary cooperation. Being an initiative of AMCAO, the facility has linkages at national, regional and continental level and works closely with regional organizations and international partners. We provide support to a wide a diversity of transboundary water resources management activities over the continent. We currently have 23 projects worth around 30, 30 million euros, which constitute a third of our portfolio. Most specifically, we support transboundary cooperation through regional and river basin organizations in areas of water governance and institutional development, information and knowledge development, monitoring and investment project preparation. Generally, the facility has contributed to the overall cooperation architecture in either initiating cooperation where it is weak or non-existent, or in strengthening and enhancing existing mechanisms. For example, we have supported the establishment of the Volta Basin Authority, have prepared Ida Bram's strategic action plan for the Congo River Basin, and have also assisted in drafting the Lake Chad Basin Water Charter. The range of transboundary operation include dealing with challenges of shared aquifers in North Africa and shared rivers in West, Central, East and Southern Africa, as well as strengthening regional frameworks, continental and regional economic community levels. The facility's support has fostered cooperation at the basic level and facilitating common understanding of the community of the transboundary water resources to planning and implementation of joint projects. Broadly, the facility's support has made a operational contribution in promoting cooperation on transboundary water resources management and examined from the perspective of the cooperation continuum. So we have projects that are different stages along the cooperation continuum. The first stage of cooperation is related to the coordination of collection and exchange of information, assessment of resources, preparation of development strategy, and monitoring at the basin level, as well as regional and continental platforms of cooperation. For example, we, are we have strengthened the capacity of the African network for basin organization. We are implementing the Niger and Volta Basin HICOS programs. We are improving the knowledge of groundwater situation in North, Northern Sahara, Sahara aquifer system and of the Igloo Medium and Teodini aquifer systems and Niger River Basin. And we are also strengthening water information systems and developing cooperation mechanisms in the IGAD member states. The next level of cooperation is the promotion of collaboration which implies the adoption of common frameworks or protocols to secure gains from shared water resources. At this level, the facility has been supporting the adoption, adoption of common IWM based base plans for water conservation and development and common regulatory frameworks and institutional setup leading to water resources development and management. Some examples of projects include the preparation of the multi-purpose water resource development project for the Barwa Kobo Subad Basin in the Nile system, strengthening the economic community of Central African states, ECAS, to implement regional water policy, the preparation of the Kayanga Geba River Basin, IWM plan in West Africa, and support to SADEC to establish a regional framework for water supply, sanitation, planning and management. And at the third level, kind of joint action that we are supporting that can enhance cooperation resulting in, uh, in joint action for multiple purpose, project design and implementation, institutional capacity building and the development of legal frameworks. So these operations make important contribution for the realization of benefits to the cooperation of countries, organizations and other stakeholders. And some examples of these projects include the preparation of the Transboundary Water Resources Infrastructure Development Study and the African Union's Program for Infrastructure Development, PIDA, the preparation of the Lake Victoria Basin Water and Sanitation Project, the preparation of the Songwe River Basin Development Program shared between Malawi and Tanzania, 
The preparation of the shiri is on basic waterways project. So these are examples of joint action supported by the AWF. So to conclude, the AWF supports collaboration and joint actions to enhance benefits at various levels, such as the facilitation of water resource development for food and energy production, improvement of environmental management and flood risk management, the design of projects that will res result in increased food and energy supply, the improvement of water supply services, watershed management and rural infrastructure provision, the increase of volume of water transport of goods and services and trade, and the increase of access to water supply and sanitation. So you could see from this how broad is the spectrum of projects that we are supporting. And we are expecting from this uh, session that we'll also get some feedback on how AWF that is focusing on project preparation but also giving a kind, kind, uh, quite importance to water governance and water knowledge, how all these three pillars can work together for the better development of water resources and water shared resources on the continent. Thank you. I was pleased to have some lights on in from the panel. Come and join us at the table. As the panel takes their seats, I, I just want to add uh, two things. Firstly, the reason I'm here and helping to facilitate is that the African Development Bank itself has decided to undertake a review of its program of action in transboundary waters. Uh, like uh, AWF, they've had a, a range of interventions, but the question is now being asked, what more can we do? How best can we structure our work uh, to make the maximum contribution, not to water management, but to development and to regional integration? And so this session, I hope, is also going to provide some useful inputs to that process, helping to answer some of the questions that I've been asked, together with Professor Albert Wright of Ghana, uh, we've been asked to answer a number of questions about transboundary water management and what the bank's program of action should be. I also need to say that uh, this uh, session has a very much wider audience than just the people in the hall. It's currently being telecast, so uh, greetings to those in Tunis, in Tunis who are watching it and anywhere else. It's also, as I understand, going to be recorded and made available for broader use as knowledge material and teaching material for the bank itself and for the AWF. So we're part of a bigger process and remember your audience at home as you're talking. Having said that by, by way of introduction, we now need to turn to the panel and the process. Um, We've got a really distinguished panel, and I think when we were introduced, we said there were going to be fireworks. Uh, there was a suggestion that there was going to be some gender fireworks, and maybe you looked at the program and said, well, there's three men and three women, why should that be? Um, the one answer is you don't know some of the women on this panel. Um, and the other is just to say that we've had an apology from Gustavo Saltiel, who's uh, from the World Bank, uh, running the, the cooperative water uh, management program, but he's been substituted, late substitute Jacqueline, by Jacqueline Trump, um, who is Gustavo. Now she really makes the point, men are a threatened gender species here. Uh, but you're very welcome, Jacqueline, and uh, thanks for stepping in at, at late notice. Uh, as per the program, I'll ask the panelists just to introduce themselves to you very briefly, two or three minutes, what they do, what their particular interests in transboundary management are, and then we're going to start addressing some of the key questions that have been highlighted in our program. Um, we'll discuss a little bit within the panel, but then it's going to be over to you. We want to hear some of your comments and questions uh, about the key challenges that face Africa in the very many diverse transboundary uh, water situations that we have. River basins, groundwater, shared aquifers. Uh, what are the challenges that we face? What are the actions that have been taken that have worked? And what needs to be done in a more structured and uh, organized way in the future, perhaps, to have more effect? Um, at the very end, I'll give the panelists two minutes each to wrap up and highlight what they think are the most important points for themselves coming out of this session. So, having said that, um, can I turn to the panel? Akisa, you've already kind of introduced yourself, but would you like to just tell us a little bit about your background, because you're much more than the African Water Facility. So, Akisa Barry, coordinator of the African Water Facility, and former IMI Regional Africa Director, and also, yeah, I've been working on water issues for 
as a researcher before moving into operations with the uh, African Water Facility. Thanks, and then I'm just going to go straight down the table, no alphabetical order here, so uh, Pat, okay. over to you. Mike, you just want us to say something about ourselves now, not our introductory comments? Or I think next you, round? You can use your, this time for your introductory comments. Please. Well, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, my name is Patricia Welters. I'm an international water lawyer. Uh, I, was, I am the founding director of the Dundee UNESCO Center for Water Law Policy and Science. I've just recently been seconded under the Chinese government Thoughts and Talents program to establish and enhance water, international water law capacity in China. So I'm at the Shaman Academy of International Law in China. And I'm here really in my capacity as GWP Tech, uh, where I've been leading, heading up the Transboundary Waters program. My introductory comments, I just really have three um, and a preface. The preface is, it's just so wonderful to be here on Africa Day. It's just a delight and thank you very much for inviting me. I'm seeing so many colleagues and friends from over the years. I've got sort of three questions, um, provocative I hope, not noting our chair. Uh, first, the question that I'm concerned about is the role of international law in promoting or implementing the duty to cooperate. In international law under the UN Charter, the fundamental rule of all of international law, not just international water law, is the duty to cooperate. And I'm interested to see what that means in a world of competing sovereign national states. So that's the first thing. The second thing I'm especially interested in in the, in the continent in Africa is this nested governance framework and I have had so many colleagues over the past week when we've been having consulting partners meetings with the GWP I've had so many African colleagues say to me why should we ratify the UN Water Courses Convention and what is this new instrument the uh, 1992 Helsinki Convention it's now been made universal should Africa should my country be ratifying this and how does this relate to the SADAC regional protocol and what about the bilateral agreements that we have so we have uh, some treaty congestion and perhaps um, uh, confusion and I would like to see how uh, we help make more of the international law through the treaty regimes accessible and important and relevant across Africa and then the third strand really relates to building from the bottom up. And where I see a gap is in the link, if we're speaking about hydro diplomacy, the link between the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, those people who ha are struck with uh, uh, representing your countries in international affairs, and the water resources people. And I find there is a gap there. So my hope is that we might, through higher education, um, develop this new generation of local water leaders where the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who negotiate the treaties actually know something more about water resources. So I'm looking for this new species of hydro diplomat and those are my introductory comments. Thank you Mike. Thanks very much and I think that's exactly the frame that we want to try to understand people's particular interests and their, the issues which they believe are of concern. Moving on down the table, uh, uh, Dr. Tefera Bien, uh, from the NBI, we were joking last week, we were in a meeting in Entebbe, and he said, oh, but we're going to be on the panel together next week in Stockholm, so I'm delighted to have him here. We can continue last week's conversations. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Stefara Vajena, I'm the Executive Director of the Nile Basin Initiative. I have been um, in the Nile cooperation process for quite some time, in fact, uh, since uh, Late 2000, uh, in a different capacity, of course. I've been the exhibit director since uh, uh, September 2012. Uh, let, let me take uh, this opportunity to, to say uh, a few words about the Nile and the Nile Basin Initiative that I am heading right now. Um, the Nile is one of the uh, great rivers of the world, as some of um, many of you uh, might know already. Uh, it has supported great civilizations uh, for millennia. Uh, the river is shared by 11 uh, African countries. Uh, compared to other uh, river basins in Africa, the Nile Basin has relatively less water, with uh, most of the river flow 
are being generated from uh, less than one third of the river basin area. Uh, up until 1999, uh, the nine countries never had an own uh, inclusive cooperation platform. Uh, there were, of course, uh, many attempts to bring the rapidian uh, together. However, they were um, all had limited uh, scope and mandate, and also had limited membership. It was only in 1999 that the All Inclusive uh, Nile Basin Initiative was launched. The NBI is guided uh, by a shared vision that focuses on sustainable development of the shared Nile water resources through cooperation. Uh, the Nile Council of Ministers uh, is the highest uh, decision-making body for the NBI, assisted by the Nile Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, NBI has three core functions, namely facilitating cooperation, water resource management, and water resource development. Uh, the initiative has three centers to discharge uh, the mandates along these three core functions. NBI, in short, stands for cooperation and promotes joint and collaborative water resource management and development. I will stop here. Okay. Thanks very much. And I, and I think it's, it's important to have somebody from the Nile because, as I was saying outside, in many cases, we take the Nile as a template of a shared river in Africa. Yet, uh, we need to remember that the Nile is probably the only shared river in Africa where 100% of the water is used. Many of our other shared river uh, situations, our challenges, uh, uh, the uh, executive director of the African Development Bank, Mom Kabaruka, says, the challenge in many places is that we don't use the water we have in shared rivers. So we must use the template of the Nile, but also remember that most of Africa's shared rivers, if anything, are underutilized rather than overutilized. And I'm going to carry on interjecting as a moderator simply to highlight some of these points. I hope I don't abuse my position. Can I then turn uh, to Anna Kashkal? Um, I was very confused. I thought she was uh, based in, in Lisbon, but then I saw she was from Siwi. Anna, just tell us where do you live and what do you do? <laughs> okay, I live in a 19F of an airplane. <laughs> Constantly traveling to all these uh, nice uh, African uh, river basins. So if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. So and you have started already with a provocation about the Nile, so it, it's almost like do we have to respond to this, or should I just introduce myself? Do your introduction, okay. we'll get yes. to the Nile. I just want to whet your appetite okay. in the audience. Okay. Uh, uh, Anna Kaskau, uh, I know all the members of the panel. <laughs> uh, exactly, yeah. including Gustavo, and most of the people in the room, but in any case. So, I'm a political scientist uh, that have been working in particular in uh, uh, Nile issues. Did my PhD starting already like 10 years ago. Uh, on the hydropolitics. I think this is a, uh, a word that goes together very well with the title of this uh, uh, session, which is Hydro uh, Diplomacy. And uh, since four years ago, I've joined uh, CUE. Uh, I'm part now of the Transboundary Unit. I was part of the capacity, capacity building uh, as well. I think I don't have to introduce CUE because it's the organizer of this event. So you all know what we do uh, in a way or another. It's a think tank that's uh, including other things, look at transboundary, uh, transboundary issues. And works not only on research, but in particular in uh, 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 what we call advisory service. And uh, most of the people that we work with, it's river basin organizations in Africa, which is the, 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 what brings me here, uh, but as well in, in, in the Middle East, uh, Asia and uh, Latin America. So, and recently I had the opportunity, uh, in the last two years, of starting to work outside of the Nile Basin, and, which is very interesting because people working in the Nile tend to see the world in a different way, right? And then we arrive to Botswana, to Namibia, to Mozambique, and say, oh, there's different ways of doing things in uh, complicated or complex uh, real basins anyway. So I think my uh, idea here and uh, uh, to the panel is not just on Nile issues, but as well uh, Southern Africa, experiencing the Southern African Thank you. 
thanks, thanks very much for that, and thanks for locating the very different and different uh, uh, complexes that we face as we try and address the, the, the challenges of transboundary water management. Jacqueline, I don't have any brief for you. Uh, you're, you're clearly not Gustavo, we know that. Um, but could you just give us an introduction, and if sure. you can to talk a little bit about the cooperation in International Waters uh, for Africa partnership, because I think that is particularly relevant. To sure, us. no problem. So I'm Jackie Tran. I'm um, new to many of you, as I'm new to the World Bank, I just joined the World Bank in April, coming from the U.S. State Department, so I'm bringing the political economy experience with me, but my background is as an engineer, so I'm hoping to bring some of the technical with the political, um, and working on the Cooperation in International Waters in Africa program at the World Bank. So. It's a multi-donor trust fund focused specifically on unlocking the potential for growth through facilitation of cooperative water resources management and cooperative water resources development. We do many of the things that Akissa mentioned in, in her discussion and, and we're working on some collaborations. Um, and because of that, we actually have many of the same questions that you're struggling with. So some of the questions you put out in your introductory remarks along the lines of how do you balance knowledge with investment for reparation are also questions that we're struggling with. Um, we've been sort of framing it as the three I's, information, institutions, and investment. How do you balance those three? What's the appropriate approach if you focus too much on the um, investments you may end up making poor investment choices, whereas if you focus too much on uh, institution building or, or the agreement side of things, you may lose the interest of all your stakeholders other than the, than the people up on the panel. Um, and so those are, the, those are the kinds of things that we've been struggling with as well, and I'm, I'm also hoping for a good discussion on. Um, there's, there are a couple of other good questions that that I think would be nice to sort of talk about. Uh, one of them that comes to mind that we've been struggling with is, is time frame. So time frame for results, time frame for um, keeping people's interest, time frame that is either political or development oriented or, or um, investment oriented. And, and how can we balance these the interest in information and investments with the actual realistic time frame it takes to build an institution or come up with a regional investment. So that's something that maybe we can talk about a little bit as well. Okay, thanks very much. I think you'll see we've got a really interesting panel, you know, ranging from the lawyers and, and, and the political scientists. Delighted to see engineers and water quality specialists. I mean, you used to be one of these. So. Uh, hydropower engineers as well, you know. We've got a nice balance. And I hope, because of the balance from different regions and interests in different places and different issues, we'll get a good discussion. Now, I was given a set of questions that we should put to the panel as a challenge. And I'm going to do that, but I'm going to also ask, and I want to ask the audience, um, are they the right questions to be asking? And let me give you the first question that was put and see whether uh, we feel comfortable with it. This is a question which says, what is the problem of achieving greater progress in transboundary uh, water resource management? Is it that there's no political will? Is it that there's no ownership at national level of the cooperation process? Because that's what we have been quite often led to believe. And because I've worked at national government level as well as at regional level, I'm sometimes tempted to say, we're always complaining about political will. And the worst thing that ever happens is when the ministers and heads of state say, well, tell us what we should do. Tell us what the problem is and what we need to do. Because when we get that political will, we quite often find we don't have the answers. So I want to put to the panel, is there really in the very many different transboundary basins in Africa a problem of political will to cooperate? Or are the challenges just something different? And we're assuming that the challenge is setting up transboundary arrangements. But maybe the challenge is they don't know how much water is in the river in the first place, nor who's using it. And the issues are quite different to what we believe as external experts are the problems. Who would like to take that? Kisa, actually, you helped to structure that question. I'll throw it to you first. I think that there are different situations depending on the pressure on the water resources. So 
your question, I would say I would say yes and no, depending on where we are and depending on the basis. So as you said, there are different situations depending if it is, I mean, on the basis and, and uh, the use and development of the resources. First of all, it's clear when I see our portfolio, a number of. Uh, uh, projects that were related to uh, water information and water governance. This is the bulk of our uh, the request that we get, and so it means that when we look at the uh, again the cooperation continuum, there is a need to provide the information first, assessment of the water resources, and there are quite very interesting projects that are ongoing actually and that are needed. You cannot start. Investing in a project if you don't know what is your resources, if you don't put the water information systems in place. And we, we are doing this, so even if uh, we have been told that we have to do more project preparation, but I mean, unless we have this, we cannot. So I think that in, depending on the place, as you said, uh, the Nile is a little bit different from other situations, but uh, I, I would say that we need to have this uh, information. And then the political will, I would say, when we are moving along the cooperation continuum and looking for joint uh, action, then this is where we need champions that will lead this kind of uh, projects because we have like around the Lake Victoria, we have the problem of water quality, different countries needed to use the water for drinking purposes. Um, and a good example is uh, the uh, OMVS in the Senegal River where you have joint institution, joint management of, uh, of uh, infrastructure. So when we think about the three eyes, the information, uh, information, institution, infrastructure, it's clear that we need the three of them, and depending on where we are, there will be, this political will be, be expressed, you know, at one point in a stronger way, but I mean, it is needed in order to have uh, any, so I, I will, you know, not completely share your point, but I think that it's really needed in order to have things uh, moving and that uh, this, there is this grow, growing awareness about uh, the need to share, the need to, to develop the resources for the benefit of the population, but also and to protect them at the same time and to have for the different, uh, different uses. But this is what I will, I will say. You know, I used to uh, manage the south side of the Zambezi River in Mozambique. Um, we used to manage it for water supply and agriculture. That, that's a shared river, but there was never any shortage of water. All those upstream countries let the water run down. In fact, sometimes they let too much run down. There were floods. So who else on the panel wants to take up this issue? Is there actually a demand for cooperation, a political will for cooperation? Or is there a problem that politicians can't actually see the specific benefits in their case of cooperating? And if there's no particular benefits that they can see, they're not going to engage. So again, who, who wants to take that? Um, Anna? Uh, I think basically there's a perhaps a missing word here. First of all, we know that water is political, in a way or another. If it's, if it's a very complex uh, river-based organization, or maybe one just shared by two countries, tends to, to be political. And who is in charge of taking decisions concerning, in particular, uh, transboundary waters? But I think uh, most of the politicians are risk avoiders. They uh, try to avoid risk. And this is a word that should be in our dictionary. We talk about benefits, we talk about costs, but more associated with investment. But this idea of taking risks. And I think one of the risks that is usually not even considered by researchers, institutions, is the risks of no, no cooperation. So if we say, oh, what is in there for me? There is a dam, there is an agriculture project, uh, and you can see that the different countries can see benefits. But what about if there is no cooperation? It's a lot, a lot of a lot of situations could have been avoided be drought or related to droughts or to floods. And I think we don't consider enough the externalities of that that's no cooperation. And we should start thinking about it. And we can see this in, in several different uh, cases. Other members of the panel, would you like uh, a pat on that chair? Thank you, Mike. Um, from, an, from a legal perspective, uh, the issue, I thought the last speaker in raising the temporal issue, how long it takes to develop cooperation, is an interesting one. And so we look at the origins of the Law of Nations, uh, most recently in 1945, captured in the UN Charter. Why did we have the United Nations Charter? It came after the Second World War, after two horrible wars, to try to create this community 
of states who agreed that war was not the way forward. We have to find peaceful means. So we use the UN Charter as sort of the foundation for the reason for cooperation. Article 1 says that the purposes of the United Nations are to promote regional peace and security and to advance the fundamental freedoms of all. In my work in looking at transboundary water resources, it's really the articulation and attempted implementation of that higher level objective in treaty regimes. But how long does it take? How long does it take to find cooperation in, an, in a constellation of competing sovereignties? Well, the UN Water Courses Convention, that's just one multilateral instrument, took some 30 years to study, to get through the UN system, to be adopted as a UN resolution. And only now, after another 20 years, will enter into force, and it will enter into force. It will enter into force probably in December. The point I'm trying to raise, Mike, and the point that is missed out often by uh, the donor agencies and the banks is that in transboundary water resources, like an international law, there is a long horizon. And so you should not rush things. It takes, you know, in a multilateral context, you might have 200 states in there. You know, I've studied and know quite well many of the negotiators. Mike, you've negotiated a treaty, bilateral, multilateral, probably easier. But in a multilateral context, in transboundary water resources, which are connected to everything, you know, it's connected to everything, and you have to think of the diplomats and the international lawyers, the ones in foreign affairs, negotiating this. They're not all water people. It's not only about water. It's about state sovereignty. And unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, we see that there are strong limits on state sovereignty. And so what I'm looking for in, in my work is actually to see how we have national, because it is national leaders, promote the fundamental interests of the nation state in a way that moves beyond strict state sovereignty into a higher level objective. And that is very aspirational and really hopeful. But I honestly believe from many of my students and sort of the anecdotes that I have, and many of you have been to Dundee already, and now the people I'm working with in China, I see this new wind, this new generation, who think about things differently. And so I hope the barriers to state sovereignty, which I think are the barriers to water cooperation, will soon be transcended. So water law really important, state sovereignty ever an issue, long horizon, and uh, I'm hopeful despite all of that for the future. And may I just say that Africa as, as a continent is leading the ratification of the UN Water Courses Convention and also has been one of the most active, uh, actively engaged continents in the progression of international law, certainly in treaty regimes. So I think well done, well done you. Tafer, do you want to come in on that issue? Yeah, I wouldn't say that there is um, a complete lack of uh, political <coughs> For cooperative, for cooperation, for cooperative development of projects in the transboundary river basins. If you take the, the case of the Nile, uh, of course, um, the the cooperation has go, hasn't gone as far as we wanted it to be, and uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm about uh, cooperative development in the Nile basin uh, some 10, 12 years back, uh, and we all know. Uh, but corporate development has obvious uh, advantages and huge benefits for the uh, Liberian countries. And yet, uh, we don't see uh, projects being developed. Uh, so this, you know, uh, could be taken as a kind of indication of, of, of a lack of uh, political uh, commitment. Um, it's true that uh, these projects have not uh, been uh, developed. Well, there, there could be um, reasons for that, maybe um, lack of information, maybe perception, not uh, facts dictating views, um, maybe cooperation viewed as a zero-sum game. Uh, there is this common view that uh, upstream development uh, has uh, adverse uh, impacts um, to downstream. Um, so, even though that uh, studies commissioned together, like in the Nile Basin Initiative, like in, in both sub-basins, Eastern Nile and 
uh, NELSA region uh, confirmed that uh, cooperative development has huge advantages for Rikirian countries, uh, huge, huge benefits. Uh, the development um, has not yet uh, taken off uh, the ground. Um, so, for this, maybe lack of information could be one reason. Uh, maybe, uh, as I said, consumption, dictating views, uh, rather than uh, you know, uh, facts. Uh, again, uh, maybe lack of, uh, again, I, I wouldn't say that uh, the lack of understanding of uh, opportunities for cooperative development, but uh, as Anna pointed out, maybe a complete uh, kind of understanding by all uh, decision makers at all uh, levels of, of the cost of, uh, of not cooperation. As uh, uh, Anna said uh, in, in the beginning, there was a provocation that uh, the Nile also has 100% utilized. Well, it is uh, true that the, uh, it has reached its uh, safe yield. Uh, if, if we uh, if a uh, member state can develop uh, you know, a project, uh, this, the hydrologic regime uh, could be changed uh, if there uh, were no, uh, cooperative uh, development uh, because of that, this uh, situation. So, but again, there is uh, a strong need, a demand for uh, development uh, because of the uh, pressure of uh, population, uh, economic growth, and development cannot be stopped. Uh, but then, is there a complete uh, understanding uh, of, of uh, the risk of, of no cooperation uh, by all the uh, um, decision makers at all uh, levels? I mean, this, this could be uh, one reason. And we, maybe there could also be a fear of uncertainty of, of the future. Uh, this may uh, you know, uh, lead to lack of willingness to take decisions uh, to avoid uh, political risks, as uh, Anna uh, mentioned uh, earlier. So I would say uh, probably there is a need to, to do, and then there is no sufficient trust, so there is a need to do uh, a lot, uh, particularly to have uh, shared values of cooperative development and management of the uh, shared uh, resources. And Another uh, reason uh, also uh, complexities of political decision making processes in the uh, Solomon uh, riparian states, uh, many factors, uh, many players, uh, many aspects to be seen uh, before uh, decision decision. So this could have already slowed down the cooperative uh, development, though they are beneficial for uh, riparian countries. Thanks, and uh, you, you have very specific <coughs> circumstances, so it's interesting that maybe it's not political will in those cases, but it is a political risk aversion and concern about uncertainty that's constraining cooperation in the Nile. Jackie, do you want to add something to this and perhaps think about areas where there isn't so much contest, where there isn't so much risk, where the question is more, there appear to be regional opportunities for cooperation in relatively underdeveloped basins but they still don't happen. Have you got some examples of that? Sure. Well, uh, the comment that I wanted to add was, just following up on Tafera's remarks, is that what we've seen is that it's often political will of whom? Who, who are we talking about? You typically see pretty good political will for the water ministries to work on water projects. It's usually not an issue. It's more of getting the energy ministries or the agricultural ministries to think about a water-related project. Well, I don't, I don't work on water. I work on agriculture. It's not my, it's not my problem. Um, and so then the question that we, that we have tried to ask ourselves is, okay, if the political will problem is not the water people, it, who do we need to provide the right information sources for? And then we're, we're, so we're trying to think outside that box, and that's bringing together your information question with your political will question. One of the main tools that we've been using and um, we've seen in a couple of the different bases that SEAL works in has worked quite well to raise political will is doing a multi-sector investment opportunity analysis. So very sounds very, very complex, but basically you look beyond the water sector at the energy sector and the agriculture sector and see where are your investments going to pay off the most. And so then you're, you're essentially providing the right information to, to raise political will of the people who actually make the decisions based on economics. So. 
That's music to my ears because with one of my other hats on as a commissioner of the National Planning Commission in South Africa, what we're trying to set up is getting the planning agencies of the different countries talking to each other because we see whether it's in power or agriculture or water, if there's a power opportunity in one country that depends on the water ministry of another country, they don't talk to each other. And so we might have very simple institutional obstruction that is nothing to do with political will, but maybe just to do with the failure to identify opportunities. Pat, I'm going to just try and move us on to the next question, which I'm sure will give you an opportunity to come in. No, you want to, you want to come in? I, I, you said I was going to have fireworks, right? <laughs> Mike and I know each other and love each other. Um, but on that, I've looked at some of the banks, um, uh, you know, what did you call it? Multi yeah, these things. And then everyone agrees. <laughs> that, those are multi-sector investment opportunity studies, right? okay, not, so not just those things. But on the ZAMCOM, if there's no legal agreement, you can't go ahead. So all of the opportunities in the world, unless you have them framed in a legal agreement, are kept immobilized, in fact. So I get back to the legal agreements and then the layers of legal agreements that you require to sort of cement and provide a framework for going ahead. So there is that barrier. But Mike, you and I have talked about that before. You see, this is where I disagree with you. You know, this is, as an engineer speaking to a lawyer. Pat, <laughs> but you know, not. when I was an engineer and I had a country on one side of the river and myself on the other side and we wanted to build a dam jointly, we went ahead and built it. Yes, indeed, there were some agreements that were uh, in place, they but the lack of an agreement that specified we cannot, it didn't say we can build a dam, but it didn't say we cannot. And sometimes there is a question whether there are obstacles in basin, uh, uh, in, in, in transboundary basins, whether there are obstacles if everyone is not part. But let me tell the audience a secret. We were asking for examples outside of good transboundary cooperation that somebody said the Songwe Basin between Tanzania and Malawi is an excellent example of good river basin cooperation. And I said, oh, really? Does ZAMCOM agree to that? Because, of course, the Songwe River is a tributary of Lake Malawi, which is a tributary of the Shir, which is a tributary of the Zambezi. And they said, oh, I hadn't realized that that was a transboundary. It didn't matter. What mattered was the two countries practically wanted to resolve a problem. So what are the main barriers to cooperation? The next question. Are the barriers actually this lack of structure, lack of political will? Or is it a lack of knowledge of the opportunities? Or is there really an institutional barrier to cooperating once the opportunities have been identified? Um, which order should we start in? Does anyone want to answer the question, what are the real barriers? Because I would challenge you in saying that political will may be a problem, but if the opportunities are clear, politicians have a way of actually taking notice. What are the real barriers to cooperation? Where are there cooperative projects that aren't happening? And perhaps, Tafer, you've got one or two of those, as you've mentioned. Yeah. Um, well, um, again, I have to talk about the Nile, the Kingdom of the Nile. The Kingdom of the Nile, the Nile um, as I said, there was a lot of talk about corporate development, there was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot, a lot of expectation, particularly because of the absent countries, uh, to see uh, the projects on the ground. Uh, and yet, that was not happening. Uh, it's, in fact, it's rather going to the other direction for some reason. And uh, I would say uh, one of these reasons, um, maybe Professor uh, would say that um, agreements would facilitate uh, cooperation. But uh, in the case of the night, actually, uh, agreements are the most stumbling blocks uh, <laughs> preventing, preventing actual uh, cooperative development projects, I would say, uh, be it existing agreements or otherwise. Uh, like in the, uh, you know that uh, NBI, uh, the cooperation of the night has been following two tracks, and one was division on the uh, legal and institutional framework agreement and the, the most sticking issue in that negotiation process was uh, again this agreement like the existing agreement uh, some parties say that uh, existing agreement shall be null and void to the extent of the inconsistency the present for your the other say no no the issue there is no prejudice to the existing agreement so uh, both parties are, are drawing their 
great lines there, and it is actually a stumbling block and, um, <clears throat> for the negotiation. And, and now again, uh, the, the speed over to the uh, cooperative development is, is being very much felt, actually. Uh, as some of you might know, uh, there was a talk about joint multi-purpose projects uh, in the Eastern uh, Scoping studies was done uh, but, uh, to find out if there is a space for cooperative development. Uh, the answer was yes, there is space for cooperative development. It's beneficial. Uh, unless you cooperate, uh, the risk retention will increase. And yet, and those ideas even are then in, in the Nile region, that's where we have the, uh, the biggest potential for cooperative development. Uh, and yet now, we are not talking about cooperative development in the Eastern Nile. Uh, we talk about uh, software, uh, uh, maybe uh, involving um, academics and, and, and the like. And, uh, and the, the, the problem for this is, is again, uh, this issue. Of agreement. Uh, that's one issue. And the other one, uh, I would say, uh, you know, the disparity of development among the European countries in the Nile basin. Uh, like, well, it's, it's obvious that the, the lower part of the basin is, 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 is developing. We are talking that, uh, you know, that the water is fully kind of utilized. Uh, and, but the upper Iberian countries. Uh, they have not developed. There is uh, a big uh, pressure of population, economic growth, uh, de demand for energy and, and food, uh, and whatnot. And so there is big enthusiasm about cooperative development. Uh, so there is, you know, the, the sense of urgency uh, between the, you know, the, the riparians are not, are not the same. Uh, the one that is being pressurized, or there is a big demand of development energy and food uh, is pushing for cooperative for development. And the other party, uh, you know, the, the urgency, the sense of urgency is less. So that actually uh, hinders uh, the cooperative development uh, in, the, in, in the region. Uh, for, I think I, I would stop that. These are the major, say, obstacles for cooperative development. Uh, uh, thank, thanks very much. And I think Africa owes a debt of gratitude to the Nile countries because, in a sense, you're creating the challenge for us. And what we want to avoid is getting to a situation where you've got such full utilization that any country making an agreement is probably going to suffer prejudice or feel it will suffer prejudice. And isn't the challenge for us here to try and develop agreements before we reach that, that, that phase? And I'm asking that question because one of the, 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 the propositions that I was asked to put to the panel is this question. Should we be focusing on getting the agreements in place uh, about what countries should do on their rivers on their shared rivers, focus on getting the basic agreements in place before we start worrying about cooperative projects? Uh, is it perhaps about building the trust and discussing those uh, future opportunities? Because if you start discussing those early enough, you can get the balance of, of interests perhaps sorted out. If you wait till the end of the process, perhaps you're in difficulty. Now, um, Anna, you've been looking at this in other rivers than the Nile. So turn to the Zambezi. No, five or ten percent utilized of the water is utilized. Actually, probably less than that if you take away evaporation from hydropower dams, um, which is always a questionable use. Um, what what do we need in uh, rivers which are relatively underutilized to create the foundation for future development uh, between the between the countries? I think uh, what uh, other examples from the Southern Africa region, uh, region that show, and most likely there is not in the Zambezi, is vision. I mean, one has to look further, and not the next five years or ten years, because usually uh, politicians which most likely control the, this folder are looking for, for the short term. But if we have this kind of exercise, like the, the opportunity analysis, but uh, looking at the extreme cases. Okay, let's imagine that there is full cooperation. What happens? Let's imagine that there is no cooperation. Let's put it that way. Can Mozambique, the downstream country, in nine transboundary river basins, afford not to cooperate? Of course they cannot. 
because they are downstreams of all of them. There is opportunities in the Zambese, in the Vipopo, in the Hovuma, etc., etc. The question is that how do you bring these people on board? Because no country is going to cooperate if they don't see benefits, I mean, tangible benefits. They can adopt it as a, a discourse and they do it very frequently. But the question is as to how do you move forward? Because I'm not going to comment on the agreements or no agreements because I think that is better for that. But usually there is a need for a framework, a, a guidelines, and that exists in the SADAC region with the SADAC protocol, which it's not uh, guiding where the dam is going to be located or not, or where say, but there is the principles. And one of them that is very important, and that should be used perhaps in others, which is somehow also uh, adopted by the European Union in other contexts, is this idea of uh, variable geometry. Those that are ready to cooperate, they can move on. They cannot be waiting for the others to cooperate, because it's the one that doesn't want to cooperate that has to bear the responsibility for not cooperating. And that can be for the Zambezi, for the Incomati Makutu, for the Senegal. And why the Senegal is a good example? Because they had vision and because they had an agreement. Could it have happened without agreement? Most likely, yes. But it's not because they have two projects that are successful. It's because the institution has political power and political uh, power delegated by the states, which is not the case. Okay, I saw. Jackie and Kisa, who are both looking interested, do you want to come in there? Yes, I would like to come back to this national fishery, because this is exactly what we are also supporting in the case of the Songwe River Basin. It's a shared vision, and there are a number of projects that are derived from this shared vision, and this first thing that we are contributing to the development of this shared vision. And there are, as I said, a number of projects going from hydropower to irrigation to water supply to ecotourism to change aspects all because of the shared vision. So I think it's very important that we have this, I mean, and that people have, I mean, a common understanding of the benefits that will come out of this. So I, I agree with Pat that, uh, I mean, uh, to have a shared agreement is very important, but through uh, these projects we can contribute because cooperation is a long-term process, it's also a cost it is an expensive process. We should not forget that we need also the means in order to have to put this in place. So through the project that we are supporting, I think that we are moving along the way of reaching these kinds of means. Sure, I can, I can wrap it up here. Um, I think I would say that this, this is a really good question and one that we've been talking a lot about um, within the CEWA program as well. Um, Facilitating agreements and building institutions is very important and something that we've been focused on through the Nile Basin Trust Fund and other uh, regions of the world for decades now. Um, but one of the lessons that we've learned is that if you don't have the actual action on the ground, as we keep calling it, if you don't actually facilitate investment, you don't make that link for the riparians, it's basically development partners in the World Bank talking about how important institutions are and how important the agreements are. And you get some really important players like the downstream countries that are, that are really interested in making that happen as well. But if you don't show how results actually happen and what the realistic time frame is for that, you, you lose interest. You lose the, the interest of the people who actually need to be sitting at the table making those agreements. So finding a balance between those two is what we're really focused on. How can we we need that balance and, and uh, walk in what step with the repairs. On, on the uh, cooperation framework agreement on the Nile, for example, I see this really as the embodiment of state sovereignty. It's not a failure of international law, it's state sovereignty at its best. And the way I would, and I've said this before um, publicly, the way that I would address the current impasse on the Nile, because, you know, when I was in Kigali just a couple of years ago, I saw magnificent progress in cooperation on the Nile and all sorts of activities and projects. And so as a lawyer, people came to me and, well, this agreement is not working. You know, what you have to do is be less lawyerly about it, forget about Article 14, realize it's not about rights, it's more about procedure. The more that I am involved in this area, I think we have to elevate uh, the importance of procedural rules and mechanisms, institutional mechanisms, and that really is how we get cooperation going on the ground. You still need the agreement. The best incidents of cooperation across Africa and across the world are, sorry, but they're with agreements, and those are treaties. And 
that's where you start. You know, I was looking at uh, the Niger, for example, the Niger Basin. People ask me which agreement first, the author you know, river basin organization or an allocation framework. I said, it doesn't really matter, but you need a framework. And in international law, the governing rule is equitable and reasonable use, something for everybody most of the time based on balancing of interest, including sharing benefits or not. But it's not. It's not this fancy thing about, you know, let's share costs and benefits. It's about equitable and reasonable on this water course at this time for these people and these uses. And it moves and it changes, but at least you know it's within this legal framework. In this context where you don't have a, a, a regional agreement that applies, the UN Water Courses Convention can help. Why? Not because of Article 5, 6, and 7, although Article 5, 6, and 7, which set out the legal framework, are helpful. It's because of Part 3. Part 3, the rules of procedure, which set out sort of what you have to do if you want to develop. You give notice, wait for this time, this one comes back, they don't come back, you do this. And it's really a transparent, operational engagement and cooperation based on procedural rules. And then if you throw in an institutional mechanism that works, hey, we've got a chance. So that's, that's what I think. You know, it's interesting that the tension between the practitioner and the lawyer, you know, we negotiated an agreement between Swaziland and Mozambique and South Africa on a very contested river. There was a simple reason. Swaziland wanted to develop irrigation. They were told they wouldn't get funding unless there was an agreement in place. Uh, Mozambique wanted an assurance of water for their capital city. Uh, South Africa wanted to show that we're not the big bad hegemon, we aren't the sort of power that's going to decide everything, that we can also cooperate. So all three countries had an interest, they could see what it was. It was a really easy uh, negotiation, although the water was very stressed, because the countries had clear interests. And a nice agreement. And, and, a nice and, and if, I, I believe that if you can identify those interests first, the politicians follow, the institutions follow. So we actually do have two quite diverging approaches here. The one which says get your framework in place, and the other which is a very pragmatic approach, a very functional approach, which says where there's opportunities and where people can see the joint opportunities, they will move. And maybe actually we need a synthesis of both. Um, is the problem one of information? The last question, and I, I, I hope you're provoking some interest in, in, in the room here, because I'm going to turn to the audience shortly. Um, but the last question to address is, is the problem one of information sharing? Uh, should we be doing more to share information? And then I would ask, what kind of information? Is it hydrological information? Or what would be more important, perhaps, is information about the power requirements of neighboring countries so that we could see what the hydropower potential market is. We always tend to think about information on hydrology, but sometimes we don't look at the market opportunities for shared uh, work in, a, in another sector entirely, whether it's agricultural power or even in environmental conservation. So, who wants to go on information? Akisa, you said that a lot of the requests that come to AWF are from informa about information, and certainly visiting RBOs, they've all said, we need more information and people are reluctant to help us invest in hydrology. Is this hydrology that we need to invest in, or other kinds of information as well? I think that we need all kinds of information, but of course hydrology, but also the hydrogeology. It's also very important, and we've seen now for one of these projects in the Ilu Median and Taudi um, Aquifer and Niger River Basin, how we can get really, and in a very short period of time, very, very good information on, for example, uh, the uh, water resources assessment and groundwater resources assessment. But we need also to share this information to make it available. As I said, not only this, but also about the need, I mean, power, uh, irrigation, population, all this has to be shared. I remember that you know one thing that David Gray was pushing for is for open source information. And this is, I think, something that we need to move around, along because we, we we are pushing and doing I mean supporting this project as I said that are quite expensive on the Volta high costs and the initial high costs we put in place in Mali and so on a number of information systems a number of. Uh, uh, equipment and so on, sometimes people just wonder how they are going to maintain it, how they are going to collect the information, this is also very important. But we need them also, especially when we are talking about climate change, climate change, modeling and things like that, when we don't have the right information in place. 
So we need all this kind of information, but also to share. And so it's based also on building this confidence and trust between the different countries, the different partners, and, and to move along, I mean, in order to say this information is no more going to be really something like this secret that we should keep for ourselves, because there are other means now to get this information, we like it or not. So we have to be more confident by sharing this information, putting the benefit on the table and saying how we can better use these resources for the benefit of the population, for poverty alleviation, for the ecosystems and so on. And this will, I mean, benefit everybody. Your colleagues on information, what kind of information sharing do we need? Is information one of the barriers? Uh -huh. I think perhaps more important than if, if the information is available or can be made available is that what you do with it afterwards because you might have the best uh, DSS uh, type of system in place but the question is that it's being used in the decision uh, making process not just at the regional level but at the national level as well because otherwise if countries are working with different uh, types of information and taking decisions based on studies that most likely are not compatible so we do have a problem here uh, so uh, I'm not really an expert in this type of issue, so I think I will stop stop here. But the idea is that, yes, information is needed, but how do you make decision makers use that information in the best way to inform transboundary decisions or transboundary settings? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with Anna. The, the, the point is not only gathering the information, but also having the right people in place that know how to use the information to do something with it, taking the pragmatic view once again. Um, and I, I would say we should be talking not just about hydrology and hydrogeology and you know all, all the important science-y thing, but let's also talk about generally economic benefits of cooperation. Getting that kind of information out there is critically important and making sure that a wide variety of stakeholders actually have access to the information as well, so that the constituencies that will be supporting the decisions that will hopefully be coming out of all this information gathering know why they should be supporting it, and it's not just based on long-standing prejudices or, or sort of feelings, that they can actually get the right, um, the right kinds of information to the right people beyond the governments. So uh, we, we're coming down, as, as, as we conclude, the, before we turn to the audience, Quite important points about information requires capacity to use that. That capacity is at national level, but not just in governments. The capacity has got to be throughout the society, and it's got to cover social and economic dimensions, and not just the sort of hard water uh, issues that we, as practitioners, like to talk about. Anyone else from the panel want to come in on this before I turn? And let's get some questions from the audience and see what they're worried about. Um, you, you might think that this conversation has no bearing on your real life and real concerns. And I think that's one of the, our, ch our challenges. Quite often we have a discourse about these very specialized subjects and the group of us all have one idea about what's important and we discover that the other people have got completely different ideas. I was in one of the neighboring countries to South Africa the other day talking about a river basin organization saying, well, what does your minister think about this? And my colleague said, my minister says that he doesn't understand why they wasted so much time on, on the big transboundary river organization. There's a little local tributary which is highly contested between the farmers on both sides. And where they need a river basin organization is on that little tributary that he's not interested in the other stuff. Why did he say that? He has a constituency when he goes home that tells him they're tired of watching the farmers on the other side pumping water while they don't pump water. You know? Those kind of questions are very revealing for us, and those comments are very revealing. So I think there's some rolling microphones. Um, you've been very patient as an audience and listened to us as experts talking for an hour. I see a hand up over there. I get, well, you judge where the hands are, but I see one over here as well. Um, very briefly, please, where you, your name, where you come from, and what the question is you'd like to raise. I was trapped out in the legal morass. <laughs> My name is Robert Van Lero. Uh, I uh, come from New York where I'm uh, an attorney and a diplomat and I work with the uh, UNFCCC on climate change negotiations. Uh, Patricia doesn't need me 
to uh, carry her brief for. She's very, very articulate and a brilliant lawyer. But uh, I must agree with her wholeheartedly that uh, we have to look at the long-term picture here, particularly in Africa. And uh, it is very important that we have regional cooperation, as you, Mr. Moderator, outlined. But uh, governments can change, and cooperation between governments can end suddenly. That's why it's very important to have legal agreements with respect to sharing of these transboundary water resources. Uh, I think it would be a fatal mistake not to institutionalize these things in formal legal agreements. <coughs> I'm going to be very un naughty and turn it back on you. Can, you know, we just had the Senegalese minister who was going to be here this morning but was recalled because cabinet was reshuffled. What do, you say, what do you say to the minister who says, I need to show quick results to my president because the agreement is a long-term thing. What do you offer the minister in the short term to keep his job long enough to sign the agreement? The object is not to keep a minister in a job. The object is to uh, do what's in the best long-term interests of the country. Thanks very much for that. Uh, there, there's, a minister, there's a minister seated next to me. Uh, let, let's hear from this minister. Uh, please pass the microphone over, and if you want to pass, sir, you can pass. Uh, well, I, I'll just... Uh, I mean, I'm in agreement with, uh, with Robert in this connection. Uh, by the way, brokering uh, an agreement doesn't preclude the stakeholders to move on uh, regarding achieving a number of, uh, you know, uh, agreed programs, agreed uh, activities. So definitely he's right and uh, it's up to the stakeholders to, to ensure that they, you know, that they don't lag, lag feats in terms of realizations. I thank you. Thanks. And maybe we need to be on twin tracks, always with the long term, but trying to make things happen in the short term, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. My name is Lydia Lusenga. I'm from South Africa and I participate in the commissions that uh, we share the river basins with uh, our partner countries. Well, I do diplomacy for me is about national interest. And in this national interest, it's very important to have the rules of engagement. And the agreements for us have been very key in defining how we go forward. And as South Africa and in the region, we've drawn our strength from the revised protocol, which has assisted us in formulating the agreements that we have, like in LIMCOM, in ORASECOM, and even the, the Tripartite Technical Committee, and the other bilateral ones. And they've been very useful. And what is critical is very important that also, as we go along, we need to look at the economic side of things and the human dimension side of things. As governments, we've made those agreements and you've got very competent um, experts and engineers like Mike who define how many kilos and the hydrology that goes into those rivers. But what is key is just the rules of engagement and the rest we've always sorted it out. But without that framework, it's always difficult for us to engage. And also what is key also in these shared river basins is the joint planning joint, everything joint, 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 or whatever joint you can come up with. In ever even coming up with uh, uh, issues like studies on define, on deciding whether a uh, country X should draw water. And a good example is the one that we've come up with from Orasecom where um, the Botswana has requested to get access from the Orangi uh, through the, the, the Lesotho Highlands Water Project. They, they, they also come up, came up, we came up with an agreement just to do the joint studies and this will take, you see, so it's very, very critical to have the rules of engagement in defining your national interest because it's all about national interest. But however it comes, it, 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 it depends on how we as member states have evolved over time to come and negotiate and even fight at technical level, even though the politicians have given us direction. But at the end of the day, what is fulfilling is that whatever fights come out in the negotiation of that instrument, it's, a, it's, a, it's an instrument that guides us to, 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 to a vision that uh, brings uh, 
clarity and, and, and the solution to, to what we, we, we to, to a river basin that we are sharing. But let's look at the social dimension side of things, where we look at how these communities that are sharing the river that passes through their backyard benefit from all of that. I think that is, we need to take it further than that. Thank you very much. Okay, Can you pass it forward and then let's get it, there's a, where's the microphone on this side? Can you just Right, please. Thank you. I'm, uh... Okay. No, quickly, while you're standing, please go ahead. <laughs> My name is Emmanuel Adam. I'm from Nigeria, the Federal Minister of Water Resources, and I'm in charge of dams. Now, we've been having problems with uh, water flow in the country. Incidentally, I will not buy into the Nile model. Because if you look at Nile, the country that received the last water from Nile is not uh, as resourceful in terms of rainfall as the richer areas. The reverse is the case in Nigeria, where the last to receive the water from the Nile, and we have a high rainfall downstream. Now, to some extent, some countries might, if you have this kind of rainfall, you might be constrained to contribute to the development of the river basin if nothing adverse happens to you in terms of water supply. But if the water coming from upstream becomes so much and you cannot control it within your region, then you are drafted into going into agreement on how to manage the system. It happened to us last year when there was a lot of water from one of the tributaries, anyway, from Cameroon, and Nigeria was flooded for about three months. It was very serious. We now had to go out with Cameroonians to discuss this. Now, we shared information, both hydrological, uh, other information that is required. We also shared the ability for us to use the resources for the two countries' benefit. Hydropower irrigation, in navigation to dredge the river. Now, this is a case that we must consider very seriously. Now, if we hadn't had this problem, probably we might be of the false opinion that we are secure because we have enough water downstream. So right now, the Cameroonians and Nigerians are going into a bilateral relationship to do this. Though we have an MBA that is very far from us, the MBA has nine countries, but if these two countries can solve this problem, because these two, this river is shared by just these two countries, we believe that that can assist the MBA in the long run in drafting any charter at all. If the two countries can collaborate and solve the problem that is unique to them, so, so that we don't wait for my sister joined to this, joined to that, joined. so we can solve that one. If we are encouraged to do this within a, a region, I think it would be good. But right now, we are in that process and it is moving on very fast. Thank you for standing up with the view of the minister. It's always helpful to have the, the parties who have to deal with the sharp end talking. And I think it is so useful to look at the long term, as you were saying, and the short term. What happens when there's a flood? Did you have the information coming to warn you? And is there anything that you're planning to do to avoid it in the future? That gives you something to talk about, but that long term agreement remains very critical. I mean, that's, that's the message we're getting. Other hands, I've lost track of where the microphones are. Can you do the distribution? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you, you gave me the microphone. I'm not talking as the executive uh, secretary of AMCAO. I'm talking as the participant with interest also. Um, happen to be also one time a minister who chaired the basin. I want to go with the other word that um, it's not necessary that everything has to have a legal uh, agreement for it to go to work. You know, uh, it may, you call it from New York, said that governments change. We have known, we have been, we are living in Africa, government change so often. But the certain principle that gov certain governments agree on that basin continues. Legal instrument will help it with intent. But the, but the two countries, you know, they are the principles of sharing the same thing and the understanding. The, the uh, Deputy Minister of South Africa this morning gave us an example of a small tributary of between two South African, I think, uh, yeah, that the two villages said that there is benefit there. They said, look here, let's work together and reap the benefits of here. They did not wait for 
the uh, Orasocom or whatever to do it. And we are, the Nile has, has said it sometimes brought uh, some obstacles, like the legal instruments, our dial lawyer did not elaborate because you have different types of agreement. You did not tell us about the soft laws. You know, you can have a protocol. You can have a non-binding non uh, uh, instrument, principles and the hard law. So all of these are available. But once the two countries or the Beijing share a common vision and see their benefit, they can work together and wait for those <coughs> things, uh, the legal instrument that we know from our experience takes a lot of years. Look at the uh, uh, water course since 19 when it still has not been ratified. We are still struggling for some countries, but still countries are cooperating. So I think the, the theme, cooperation, is based on common interest and the political will, once the political will is there, it can happen and then the law can entrench it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, microphone is where? Um, here you see this is this is an interesting kind of example. Uh, I have a very simple uh, yeah. question. Um, he grabs the microphone. He has the resources. Yeah. <laughs> my name is my name is Tom Ostermeyer. I'm uh, working with the Water Integrity Network in uh, Berlin. Um, I'm sitting here in a learning mode. I'm not a specialist in, uh, in this area. Um, it's striking the long-term element of uh, Africa, which is one of uh, increased urbanization, particularly in certain uh, uh, areas near coast or near big rivers, increased development of uh, larger scale agriculture, which is coming up, uh, uh, tremendous developments uh, also in mining, for example, in, uh, in certain river basins. Uh, and go coming from a country, the Netherlands originally, where water quality is so important when it comes to the Rhine River in particular, or the Shelder River. Um, having seen places where companies or cities uh, got rid of their wastewater just before the frontier, because uh, then it, uh, it was not a problem with their own laws. I wonder simply, uh, is there uh, quality, water quality issues uh, as well in the long term? In, where in, in Africa? Because it, it did not come up at all in, in these deliberations. So my question is, is the question. Thank you very much for, for a straightforward question. I'm throwing it straight to the panel while the microphone goes to the man behind you. Uh, panel, do you, anyone want to respond on water quality? Just wait a second. Does the panel want to have any response on water quality and transboundary? Uh, Akisa? We had a good example with the lake, uh, lake basin. The Thank you. Like Victoria Basin, where it was a water quality. So very often, because of the discharge of untreated wastewater or mining, it is an issue, and there are also projects that are <coughs> set up in order to address them. Okay, quality is an issue, um, and, and certainly some agreements address it more than others. Please. Yes, I think uh, mine is to persuade the participants not to really miss words when they need to take action. Recently, I think under the AMCO umbrella, we were given a study tour, a very good one in Germany. And then we were trying to look at uh, uh, the way they came up with the agreements. I think I, can, I think it's the river right where some they thought it was not necessary. And then I think at one point there was a problem. I think in either, either Netherlands, and I think within a very short time they came up with a, a pro, a, a, an agreement, legal instrument, in order to manage the river basin itself, and we created a commission out of that accident, let's call it an accident. We should not wait for accidents to happen. I think of course the South African way. These small things of uh, uh, two countries coming together and then they agree short-term business, that's not the way to do For example, I can give you an example of my own country. I'm from Kenya. We have very good relations with Ethiopia in terms of managing the shared water resources. We had a standing committee, but then at one point, it sort of became not functional. We are now engaging one another seriously to come up with the, the, the rules of the game, like the way that, that lady was saying. Yeah? And therefore, a, a, a labor instrument. You may be my friend today, and tomorrow you are not. So why am I saying? In fact, be true to yourselves and be true to the future generation. Shared water resources, according to me, you need those labor instruments. There's no shortcut. Thank you very much. Thanks for that. Um, 
We are coming to the end, and I'm, I'm given very firm instructions about coffee time. So uh, a couple more questions, or I don't see very many questions uh, or comments, and then I'm going to turn to the panel and say, you've had a very wide variety of inputs. I want to have your one-minute summary of where you stand, how you respond to this discussion we've just had. Please. Thank, thank you, Mark. I'm Pelala Mary from Sada. As a lot has been said by Sada as examples, I, I just want to make additional information to say that, yes, I agree with Professor Patricia. You really need to be patient with uh, processes of negotiating agreements and coming into force. But, uh, rather, however, we have subsequently, uh, in the Zambezi, now got all the countries except one. And the major one which had been behind has now acceded to the protocol to the agreement, Zambia. So we are really moving forward, and we are actually strengthening the secretariat and getting the institutions in place. So yes, patience, this started in the early 90s. We are here now, and this, then we are having some, some success. What has been the, 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 the main thing there was, despite the lack of agreement, countries as early as 1987 already agreed to work together to an extent through the Zach Plan process and other activities. And therefore, it's, it's a two-stream thing that we have to apply that sometimes can uh, make you successful. Thank you. Thanks. He already has the microphone, so over to you, sir. And then you're going to be the last. Uh, so please, go, go for it quickly while you have the chance. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Ahmed Hayad Din. I'm chairing the My Water Sector, uh, the Ministry of Water Resources of Egypt. Um, I have a question to Professor uh, uh, Patricia. Um, I'm a technician, but uh, I just want to learn about the uh, legal issues. But before my question directed to you, I just want to clarify a very important hydrological point regarding the uh, Nile waters. You, you have mentioned, or many of you have mentioned, that 100% uh, of the Nile waters are utilized, and this is in a hydrological point of view, is not correct. If you'd like to talk about the uh, water uh, in the uh, certain basin, you have to talk about the blue water, the green water, the gray water, and all colors of water. And I'm not going to, to go in depth. Uh, my question to uh, uh, Professor uh, Ricardi, you have mentioned that the uh, UN Convention 1979 would enter into force by this December. What would be the case for a signatory country uh, which has or which is engaged in other uh, 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 agreements in, in uh, its basin or its area. This one question. The second is, um, I remember in this UN convention that there was an article regarding the uh, uh, not to cause significant harm to uh, uh, other countries. So, uh, what what would be the measures of the of the word the word significant? How 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 can you measure the, the significance here? Thank you. And Patricia, you, you, you have 30 seconds to answer those two questions here, and then you continue the discussion outside. Okay? Please just give a quick response now, and then continue outside, and then we'll take the last two okay. questions. Okay, quick answer. Uh, UN Water Versus Convention under Article 3 and 4 takes care of existing agreements, and basically the convention requires the parties to try to harmonize past agreements with existing, but it doesn't invalidate or veto past agreements, so they still live on. Um, except to the extent that they are fundamentally incompatible. So existing agreements are fine. Significant harm. The governing rule of the UN Water Courses Convention is equitable and reasonable use. Some harm is permissible. Probably not significant harm, but it depends on technical assessments. So equitable and reasonable use, and it depends on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at all those factors in Article 6. But I can tell you more later. Thank you. Last one. Please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my question, oh, I'm called Innocent Kabenga. I'm project manager for AMBO GWP project on strengthening the institutions for transboundary water resources management in Africa. My question goes to Anna. Uh, Anna mentioned something that I think is very interesting. Um, she talked about the cost of no cooperation. But I would like to know um, how much information is out there. Do we take for granted that people know what will happen when there is no cooperation? 
Uh, because most of the time when you, when you are talking about transponder data resources cooperation, how it's important, people talk about benefits, and you can have a lot of quantity of benefits. But I do think that if you, have, you were to have the same or even more quantity of uh, non-benefits or negative, they, they could add to benefits to make people cooperate. Because the negative, the negative side of no cooperation is an incentive also to cooperate. But how much, how much information there in the training and capacity building, how much information people get, the, the decision makers, so that they know that the cost of no cooperation may be even higher than... Thanks. I'm going to let you answer, Anna, and then I'm going to ask each member of the panel, after this really wild and rich conversation, what is the one important issue that you think should be highlighted for successful boundary cooperation? That's the panel's homework now. But Anna, quickly, a, a response to that? Yeah, very quickly. Uh, I think that job has to be done, right? I mean, studying for each particular river basin, and we could look at uh, from a local perspective, national perspective, uh, transboundary perspective, what are the costs uh, of no cooperation. I mean, this would be the status quo. If nothing happens, uh, Teres Paris, was, uh, as it says in Latin, what happens? And then, most likely, countries could understand, or actors or stakeholders could understand better what is in their food for them. Because they understand, okay, so there is this risk. And I think one of these uh, risks that could be associated is the reputational risk. What is the reputational risk for those that decide not to cooperate? This has to be a factor as well. Okay. Thanks very much. Let's start at the other end of the table, Jackie. One key issue that is key to success of transboundary water management. What would you put on the table? Sure, so I, I'm going to be very brief. I've just got a couple words. I don't know, I'm not going to put your mold on one issue. I'll just say balance and patience. Thank you. I think that, that is the kind of approach we're looking for. <laughs> Beyond that, make cooperation attractive. <laughs> I'd say. Uh, Actually, the cooperation, I would say, like, like Lydia, now up there said, join, join, join. I'd say cooperation, cooperation, cooperation. Cooperative development has huge benefits for Iberian countries. It maximizes the share of the pie of each and every Iberian country. The Trump countries, the Iberian countries, has to cooperate. Pat? Three short things. Um, peace takes time. Peace takes people. And the duty to cooperate is required in international law. The two things that we need are it is a short term and long term process. Cooperation is a dynamic, iterative, and uh, adaptive process that needs trust and confidence. Okay. You know, out of this very diverse It was a very diverse panel, a really diverse set of perspectives, dealing with very, very different contexts, ranging from the Nile to the Songwe and a couple of other small ones. And what we see is there are some key words coming out. And I believe we need to try and structure uh, the kind of wisdom that came from this session, we will do that both through the AWF and through the African Development Bank's current transboundary uh, waters program of, uh, of, pol of policy review. And I hope you're all going to benefit. But thanks very much for staying in and for engaging and for giving comments and not just asking questions. So thanks to the audience as well as well as to the panel.